Thank you, Mr. Nowak and Dr. Pella. Would all the speakers come to the podium and start uh, formulating your questions? We have the time for about four questions, so you can start thinking about those. Dr. Collins, Dr. Horton, Great job, Dr. Tapp. Question? Any questions? Yes. Mr. Bell. The question was, what is internal? Okay. What is internal process? Thank you. Any more questions? Here's a question right here, Doctor. It's a quick one. Is, is the anterior part of the prostate physiologically different than the posterior? That is an excellent question. I'm sure all of us are studying it. Don't have any degree today. The question was whether or not the uh, anterior part of the prostate is a different animal, so to speak, than the posterior part, having different hormonal stimulations and, and physiologically. There's a question in the back. Yes, my question is for Dr. Tyler. Yes. Uh, on her men's studies. Have you seen any correlation with patients who might have destructive B cells and whether or not that's a factor in the four months of their life? Because it would be just some presentation if they don't have any. Uh, I'll do the last part first. So the, so the chills and fever, ironically, and, and we've actually had a, a post route as well as a cinephilia. So the a cinephils from IL and leukin 5 have come up. So if you think about an immune response, we know that on, so I have to go a little bit to our process. That's so we do apheresis, which is a word for harvesting the white cells. And so then we infuse them back. Two weeks later, we harvest them again. And we actually get a prime boost. So we actually see a memory uh, effect. And so we typically see the chills and fever progressively getting you know, more pronounced as you go to your second and third infusion. So uh, we anecdotally actually see it as part of a positive response because the more robust your immune response is, the more robust it is against the cancer, so speaking, speaking generally. Uh, would you ask me to the B cell part? I'm sorry. Uh, right, we, we are actively looking at that now. We do have a little bit of preliminary uh, evidence uh, looking at the different fractions and how they uh, pair out and we see a little bit more of that. So there's the dendritic cells that take up the antigen and that's called the innate immune response and then there's these T cells and B cells that are the adaptive that are the program part of the immune system. We actually see a, a little, a, a fraction of those are higher generally in the African American proportion than the Caucasian. So we're actually looking at that as, as part of the explanation, but the data are small right now to make anything depend. Dr. Collins. Dr. Collins. Great. Question, question that I have. So um, Georgetown is actually getting a proton therapy machine, probably. Um, they tell me two years. Um, I think in the real world that means three or four years, but let's see if they live up to what they say they're going to do. Um, the way that I look at CyberKnife, 
or SBRT is that we're actually doing tracking. So we set up to where your prostate is, and then if it moves, we adjust. Okay. That allows us to do the treatments in five fractions versus 40 fractions. When you're doing protons, there's no real way to adjust once you've set up. So we, what they do at proton centers is they commonly put rectal balloons into your rectum every day to make sure to push your prostate up against other tissue so it doesn't move. Um, I, I think the future of treatment for prostate cancer is to make it more convenient, not less convenient. Um, proton therapy is a great treatment for prostate cancer. It cures many people. It might decrease the risk of secondary cancers because the type of radiation protons gives less um, Less, but the characteristics of protons allows you to give a less overall dose of radiation to the body. Secondary cancers are not really a problem in 70-year-old men. It's, that's more of a problem of children. So I expect once we have a proton facility at Georgetown, we'll be using it mostly for pediatrics. Um, I'm not very excited about um, taking a step back and giving 40 um, treatments uh, with the protons versus five with SBRT. But, um, there, there might be potential advantages. I think um, one of the things I like about Georgetown that it lets me do, it lets me think outside of the box. So um, maybe with protons, we can try to do a shorter treatment course when we have one, access to one at Georgetown. But um, hopefully I can give talks in the future about that. So right now we are primarily in the district and the, the regional areas in Maryland and Virginia that are close enough. Um, so it's, it's pretty dependent on our staffing right now. And so we've tended to kind of focus on some of our partners, um, churches and things that we've partnered with in the D.C. area in the uh, past, as well as going to health fairs in the D.C. area. Uh, Cherie Spencer, who's our outreach coordinator, was here earlier. She's not now. but. Uh, she's helping to get us in contact with people so that we can reach more people. So it, it's kind of ongoing right now. As, as the moderator, do I get the last question? Oh, I see somebody else has a question. Um, my question is for uh, Dr. Tyler and Trevor. Uh, prostate cancer is unique. Probability that all cancer has some type of interrelationship. So, is there anything, in the, anything for the future that perhaps could look at prostate cancer, breast cancer, tongue, all the different cancers? Is there some type of targeting system that could cure that? Uh, probably, Doctor. <laughs> uh, I'm not a, a medical oncologist, but from what I know and reading the research is. Cancer is actually, uh, and please, someone else to chime in as well, but it, it's actually a very heterogeneous disease, and it's a highly evolving disease. So if we think about prostate cancer early on, <clears throat> it's slow, it's growing, and then all of a sudden your PSA can just take off. So uh, the genetics of, of any tumor becomes very unstable, and so you get a lot of mutations. Uh, and so the cancer is completely evolving and sometimes it evolves and you'll have an area of necrosis within a tumor because it evolved, if you will, or genetically changed and actually became fatal. Then you'll have other areas that are growing. And, and then it has an amazing ability as you give a chemotherapy to develop these multidrug resistant pumps that the chemotherapy comes in, the cells develop and just throw it back out. So, so I think that's the difficulty with cancer is one, it's very different even within a person, very heterogeneous, and then across the tumors as, as well. So for there to be one target across all tumors or even one target within, we just had a, a visiting professor, William O. Uh, uh, from New York, and who's talking about any therapy in cancer, they look for it about 40 or 50 percent is really a gold standard effectiveness in a patient population. So that just tells you how different every, every type is. So. Can I answer that question? Yeah. So I have an eight-year-old son, um, and I think these guys are really smart. So I think um, when my son is 60 years old, this will be much less of a problem. <laughs> so I think the future is bright, and I think helping these guys support uh, researchers is the way to go. 
Um, and I have a lot of faith in everybody on this panel that the future is very bright. Yeah, especially with the genomics and the identifying the gene and being able to see all these gene changes. We can really look at it and there's actually, you know, gene analysis now that can actually tell who's going to live seven months probably and who's going to live 30 months. So, I mean, those, those are, we're right on the horizon of that, so I agree completely with that. Thank you. The last question. So the, um, for radi I like being a radiation oncologist because urinary incontinence is very rare no matter what we do. Um, urinary incontinence is more of a problem with surgical treatment. Um, all, you know, we are radiating your prostate and your prostate is a sexual organ. Um, it makes ejaculate. Um, when we treat your prostate, you're going to, you're going to have decreased sexual function. Um, one of the reasons why I like being a radiation oncologist is also that um, I like talking to my patients. There are things out there to help men with erectile dysfunction. Some, for some men, it's pills. For other men, there's injections. Uh, but the, and for other people, it's um, pumps. But um, there's always something out there that, that if a patient is motivated, you can help them with. I think the problem that we're having right now is that um, doctors are saying, well, I'm treat I've treated them, I'm done. I've cured them, I'm done. Um, we have to spend more effort um, on prostate cancer survivorship. When I radiate you and I cause you to lose your erections, I should be there for you to help you um, come up with a solution to your individual problem. Thank you. And I'd like to ask the audience to give this panel a final. Thank you very much. Uh, all, right. all right, thank you, Dr. Kennard, and uh, thank you for all the speakers. I think we learned quite a bit, and uh, this, these evolving trends are going to help us map our future. Uh, I wanted to do a couple of things. Number one, in your uh, materials, you have an evaluation form. Uh, we would really appreciate you taking the time to fill that evaluation form out. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say is that uh, we have uh, Dr. Kanduci, who's been with us from Tanzania, and as we get our lunch, Dr. Kanduci is going to say a few words, he's going to bring us a few words from uh, Tanzania and uh, what he's doing with his project there. The other thing is, as you know, we have taken buses to the convention center, and uh, there will be uh, someone to direct you, and we will have a line uh, where you would just somebody be along the route to tell you your next step until you get in the bus. Uh, before we break for lunch, I would again like to thank all of the presenters and all of the attendees. I think these have been uh, some informative sessions. I would also like to thank uh, those helpers, especially Mrs. Farrington, Mrs. Robinson, uh, Danielle, uh, and uh, Rika Elise, uh, for all your support. I think you've done a good job in keeping our program on schedule. And, uh, and certainly, I want to uh, thank Megan uh, Lockett again for making sure that everything's in place here. So with that, we're going to break uh, for lunch. We have sandwiches here, and then we're going to head for the buses, and I hope everyone comes to our session uh, at the convention center. It's a whole different uh, uh, type of session, the different discussions, and we need everybody there because we need to understand all sides of this issue. Thank you very much. Enjoy your lunch.